Hello, and welcome to another story reading of A Mango Shape Space by Wendy Mass. And today we'll be reading chapter 5. I'm sorry for the delay of this such a long time, like there's these big gaps. I don't mean for that to happen, it's just things are really busy at this time of year, I find. So, hopefully next week, which is March break, and then, so for the next two weeks, will be March break. So hopefully I will have more time to read for you guys and upload stuff. So yeah, that is what I hope for. But yeah, let us move on to chapter 5. The fight with Jenna is still playing over in my head as my mother leads me into the therapist's office. This waiting room is completely different from Dr. Randolph's. No crying babies, no scratching sisters. The doctor's schedule is supposedly full, but the room is completely empty, silent as a tomb. The oversized chairs are white, the walls covered with occasional landscape paintings are white, and the plush carpet is the whitest of all. I'm insanely glad I didn't bring a cup of grape juice with me. On the wall above the magazine's rack is a row of light switches with different names under them. My mother scans them until she finds the one marked Finn. She then flicks the switch on to the on position. What's that for? I ask in a whisper. I'm afraid to make any noise in this quiet white place. Dr. Friend told me to do that when we arrived. She says, a light turns on in her office and she knows to come get us. I sit in one of the chairs and sink down deep. My feet don't even reach the floor. This office doesn't feel like a place for crazy people. At least not a place for crazy people with grape juice. I have the uneasy feeling we're being watched. If there had been a moose head on the wall, I swear the eyes would have been moving. My hands get that numb feeling. Mom, I whisper from the depths of my chair. Do you think they have a hidden video camera focused on us? You know to see what we're like before we go in there. No, I don't, she replies. I wish you'd just relax. Dr. Fenn only wants to talk to you. At least someone wants to talk to me, I mutter. What do you mean? My mother asks, shifting around her own plush chair. Who's not talking to you? I sigh and say, Jenna, she hasn't spoken to me since Saturday. I told her about what's going on, and I don't know. She just freaked out because I hadn't told her before. She didn't say a word to me in school today. You know how sensitive Jenna is, my mother says, but she'll come around, you'll see. I don't know what I'd do if she didn't. There isn't anyone else I'd want for a best friend. I twist the friendship bracelet back and forth on my wrist. Molly and Kimberly and Sarah are fine for school friends, but we'd never spent much time together outside of school. We all live too far away from each other. I wish Mango were here with me, his dirty paws leaving little tracks on the white carpet. I haven't seen much of him this week. I think he's been hanging out at the Roth's house lately, sniffing around their new cat, Twinkles. I don't know which is more embarrassing, Mango having a crush on the cat, or the fact that the cat's name is Twinkles. A few minutes later, the door opens, and a tall woman who'd looked like she's in her late thirties enters. She walks over to me and holds out her hand. You must be Mia, she says. Her voice is sweet and makes me think of whipped cream, which reminds me that I was too upset to eat lunch today and could use some food. I nod. I'm Mrs. Finn, she says, bending over to shake my hand. Let's go into my office and get to know each other. Isn't it Dr. Finn, my mother asks. I'm a psychotherapist, not a psychologist. Many people make that mistake. I assure you the level of care is the same. I'm still stuck in the deep chair and have to use both hands to push myself out. My mother starts to follow us out the door, but Miss Finn stops her. This is usually best without the mothers, she says. My mother has no choice but to stay behind. I pause at the doorway and look back pleadingly, but my mother waves me on. Feeling alone and unsure, I follow Miss Finn into a small office that is very similar to the waiting room. Only this room has framed diplomas on the wall and a bowl of jelly beans on the big mahogany desk. A box of tissues is conveniently placed next to the plush couch, where Miss Finn instructs me to sit, relax, make yourself at home. The tissues are a bad sign. Either she expects me to cry or to sneeze a lot. At least I don't sink in quite as deep this time when I sit down. My toes just reach the rug. I can only gaze longingly at the jelly beans, which are about a foot too far away to reach. My stomach growls. Now, Mia, Miss Finn begins in a firm voice. All traces of the whipped cream have disappeared. Dr. Randolph has filled me in on your situation. Maybe together, you and I can figure out what is causing you to see these colors. I nod cautiously. She continues. I'm a very straightforward person. Another therapist might be the silent type, but I call it like I see it, all right? Okay. Do you see the colors, my parents? I don't usually get mad at my parents, I tell her honestly, my eyes drifting back to the bowl of jelly beans. That's my older sister's job. Remember, Mia, anything you say in here is confidential. I nod. Unfortunately, my only secret is already out. I need to ask if you've ever taken drugs, Miss Finn says, looking me straight in the eye, daring me to lie. Anything that might have caused these colors is a side effect. 
taken aback. I tell her no. I've never taken drugs. I don't even like to take medicine when I'm sick. She jots something down on her notepad. Now, Mia, what is your place in the birth order of your family? I have one older sister and a younger brother, but they don't see things like I do. She taps her pen rapidly on her desk and asks, Are you familiar with middle child syndrome? I shake my head. I don't like the sound of anything that ends with the word syndrome. Let me see if I can explain, she says, her voice suddenly soothing again. Middle children are in an unfortunate position. They get neither the privileges reserved for the firstborn, nor the special attention specific to the baby of the family. Do you follow me? I understand what you're saying, I tell her, trying not to sound defensive. But I don't think it's like that in my family. My parents don't treat us any differently. Who has the largest bedroom? Miss Finn asked bluntly. Beth does, I admit. But that's only because she was here first, you know. She was already in there when I was born. And who does your mother spend the most time with? Sack, I guess, I say, feeling slightly defeated. But that's because she has to do things with him that Beth and I can do on our own. He's only eleven. So you see what I'm saying, she asks, leaning back in her chair. Middle children can feel neglected, often for good reasons. Or they feel that they aren't as special as the other children, or even as loved. When that happens, middle children often act out. Act out, I repeat suspiciously. A child may devise an elaborate plan to get his or her parents' attention, she explains. Something that will make her stand out from the other siblings. I do not like where this is heading. Something, she continues, like telling her parents that she sees colors all the time. Colors that no one else, including her brother and sister, can see. She leans forward and waits for my response. My heart sinks, a feeling I'm becoming all too familiar with. Another doctor who doesn't believe me. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? That's not it, I assure her. Where? That's not it, I assure her, aware that I'm losing the battle to stay calm. I am not making this up to get attention. I don't even like getting attention. I just want to figure out what's wrong with me. She nods thoughtfully and scribbles one. She nods thoughtfully and scribbles some more notes. Tell me, Mia, she says, do you often get depressed for no reason? No. Do you get enough sleep? Yes. Any trouble making friends? No, keeping them in another story, but I don't tell her that. And these colors and shapes, they feel real to you? Very real. She looks at me steadily. Well then, she says, why don't I talk to your mother for a while? We'll see what she has to say. And she leads me out of her office. I swipe three jelly beans from the bowl. When we reach the still empty waiting room, I trade places with my mother. I wait until I hear Miss Finn's door close behind her, then tiptoe down the hall and stand outside her office. I put my ear as close to the door as I can without touching it. The first thing I hear is my mother exclaim, A brain tumor? I jump back against the wall, my eyes open wide. Does Miss Finn think I have a brain tumor? Isn't that what people in soap operas get before they die young and still beautiful? The grape flavored jelly bean in my mouth suddenly tastes flat. I'm sure that's not it, Mrs. Winchell, she assures my mother, and without her realizing it, me. A neurologist does a lot more than test for brain tumors. If Mia's problem is real, and not in her imagination, then a neurologist will be able to test her brain functions. Relieved but still shaken, I return to the relative safety of my deep chair. It sucks me in again, but this time I don't mind. So another doctor will poke and prod and then send me somewhere else. Why did I get myself into this? I pick up the magazine my mother left on the table and open to a page full of text. As I read, a rainbow of colors drift to my head. I close my eyes and watch the colors fade away. I imagine that, when I open my eyes again, all the letters are black, the color of the type they are printed in, and nothing more. I open my eyes and start the page. I see the black letters, but I can also see the pinks and greens and purples and yellows. I can't say I'm surprised. My mother ducks her head in the waiting room. Let's go, Mia. By the time I push myself out of the chair, she's halfway down the hall. I hurry to catch up. So what's going on? Without turning to look at me, she says, Miss Finn gave me the number of a neurologist at the University of Chicago. He's going to run some tests. What kind of tests? I ask as we head out to the car. Is something wrong with my brain? She finally stops walking and turns to me. Nothing is wrong with your brain, Mia. I size her up as she stands by the car, searching her purse for the keys. But you don't know for sure, do you? She keeps digging into her bag. I suppose I don't. Mom? What? She answers, not quite snapping at me, but almost. You already put the key in the car door. I point to the keys dangling from the lock. After that, we don't talk much. I keep peeking over at her on the ride home, but she has a sort of pinched expression on her face. This worries me more than anything else. My head feels very heavy. I flip down the visor and stare at the small mirror. 
I never thought of my brain as anything other than the place where thoughts came from. Now it's this big, heavy thing rattling around in there, all mushy and gray. And I don't know, brain-like. I move my fingers around my skull. What are you doing? Mom asked with a sideways glance. I read somewhere that doctors used to feel the bumps on people's head to tell what was wrong with them. I keep searching, but don't feel anything unusual. Don't worry, Mia. Everything will be fine. I won't worry if you won't worry. I'm not worried, she says. Me either, then. Good. Good. I echo. So neither of us is worried, she says. Right. Then we look at each other and the corners of our mouths twitch. I start laughing and she joins me. It's better than crying. You don't have a brain tumor, my mother says, shaking me awake. Dad stands behind her, beaming. What? I rub my eyes and look at my wall clocks. 6.10 a.m. Mango yawns and stretches at the foot of the bed. How do you know? I haven't even had the tests yet. Suddenly, panic grips me. I sit up and grab my mother by the sleeve of her nightshirt. Or did I have them and the doctor took out the memory part of my brain? They laugh. No, you didn't have them, my mother assures me. I just got off the phone with the neurologist. Six o'clock in the morning? She sits down on the edge of the bed. He's at a conference in Europe, where it's already the afternoon. He got the message I left yesterday and wanted to reassure us. He said that since you've had this condition your whole life, without any other neurological impairments, he can rule out diseases such as epilepsy or tumors. I lean back on the pillow as relief washes over me. What else did he say? He says he's pretty sure what's going on from my description, but he wants to meet with you first. He'll be back next week, and your father and I will drive you down. I sit up again. Wait, he didn't say anything about middle child syndrome, did he? They look at me oddly, and my mother shakes her head. So I have to wait a whole week to find out? You've waited thirteen years, right? My dad says, closing the door behind them. Thirteen and a half, I whisper. By this time, Mango has climbed up onto my chest, and I pet him while he purrs loudly. Each mango-colored puff reminds me that even though I'm not dying of a brain tumor, I still don't know what's wrong with me, and my best friend still isn't talking to me. I lie there with Mango for a few more minutes, and decide it's time for action. Mr. Davis lets me in and tells me Jenna's still up in her room. I knock on the door and wait for her to tell me to come in. Oh, it's you, she says. She's standing by her bed, trying valiantly to squeeze her school books into a purple mini-backpack that I haven't seen before. We used to make fun of people with mini backpacks, and now she has one, but she's wearing the pajamas I got her last Christmas. I'll take that as a good sign. What are you doing here? She asks. Please talk to me. I sit on the bed. I can't stand it. She lays down the backpack in defeat. What do you want me to say? For the second time that morning, I feel a surge of relief. At least she's not giving me the silent treatment anymore. I don't want to fight, and I understand why you got mad at me. Then I can't help myself. I mutter, even though I really need you to be there for me. That's an apology, Jenna asks. She crosses her arms in front of her. I tuck up my ponytail for lack of anything better to do while I think of a response. It's half an apology. The other half has to come from you. You're the one who kept the secret, she says pointedly. I take a deep breath. Listen, Jenna, I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I just couldn't talk about it. But now I need to talk about it, with you. Unless you've got a new best friend I should know about. Like the person who gave you that backpack. This stupid thing? A friend of my father gave it to me. I promised my father I'd wear it at least once. I'm relieved it wasn't from Kimberly or Molly or Sarah trying to move in on my best friend while we were in a fight. Jenna pulls her clothes out of the closet and lays them on the bed. I don't want to fight anymore either. But you don't know what it's like finding out something might be wrong with someone you care about. I've been there before, and believe me, it's really scary. I look down at the floor, ashamed. I hadn't thought of it that way. I'm really sorry if I made you worry. I'm sorry I got so mean, she says, starting to pace. But I kind of did a bad thing yesterday after you left school early. The guilt flickers across her face. I recognize it from that time she literally got caught with her hand in the cookie jar. She takes a deep breath. Well, Kimberly was asking me what was going on with you. And first I told her I didn't know because I didn't know. But then when I did know and I was so mad at you, well, I told her the truth about you seeing the colors. How could you do that? A dark cloud of dread descends upon me. I'm really sorry. Who else knows? Wait, if Kimberly knows, then everyone must know. I'm sure not everyone, Jenna says, trailing off and looking everywhere but at me. I can hear the third grade laughter ringing in my ears all over again. The passage of time doesn't make it sound any nicer. I take it back if I could, Jenna insists. Still stinging from the betrayal, I say coldly. 
what's done is done, right? I'm sure 8th graders aren't as cruel as 3rd graders. Yeah, right. No one's going to make fun of you, Jenna says. They're just curious, that's all. We'll see about that. I hurry out of her house and walk quickly back down the road, suddenly eager to get home. I hate the idea of everybody at school talking about me behind my back. I tried so hard to avoid it, and then Jenna, of all people, sets it off. Zack is sitting at the kitchen table eating scrambled eggs when I walk in the back door. Seeing him there strikes me as strange. My life is changing by the minute. When for Zack, everything is exactly the same as it was yesterday. As I pass by, he tosses a handful of salt over his shoulder, spraying me with it. Hey, I say, brushing the tiny crystals off my jacket. Sorry, Zack says. Didn't see you there. You better clean that up before Mom see it. And don't leave it for Mango to lick up. Relax, he says and grabs a sponge from the sink. If you spill salt, you have to throw some over your left shoulder to appease the evil spirits. No big deal. The evil salt spirits. Go ahead, make fun, Zack says, but Beth knows it's true. You're brainwashing her, I accuse him. She never used to be this way. Hey, the voodoo vixen came to me, not the other way around, he says, stuffing a whole piece of toast in his mouth. I head out of the kitchen, and Zack calls after me in a muffled voice. By the way, if you can't find Mango, he's probably hiding in the walls. Like the rest of us, Mango had found the house's little nooks and crannies that never quite fit together. I go back into the kitchen. Why is he hiding? I think Mom scared him. She's sweeping the hall, and she caught him peeing on the couch. So she chased him with the broom, and I haven't seen him since. Mango peed on the couch? I asked in disbelief. Yep. Haven't you noticed he's been a little weird lately? Weird like how? Zack shrugs, slinking around the house with his tail real low, sleeping a lot. He always sleeps a lot, I snap. His medication makes him tired. At that minute, Mango saunters into the room and heads straight to his food bowl. Zack shrugs. I bend down and examine him. Poor Mango. Maybe he's suffering from middle cat syndrome and peed to get attention. Being chased with a broom probably wasn't the kind of attention he was hoping for. Five minutes till the bus, Mom yells from upstairs. I cringe and sit down across from Zack. Hey, can you show me how to get the thermometer to read like you're sick? I really don't want to go to school today. Ah, the old thermometer and light bulb trick, he says fondly. It never fails, but you only want to use it if you don't mind being brought to the doctor. I quickly push back the chair and stand. Ugh, never mind. In my haste, I knock over the salt shaker. I turn it upright and pause. With a sigh of defeat, I pour a tiny bit in my hand and throw it over my left shoulder. Salt spirits are no salt spirits. I need all the luck I can get today. Zack smiles proudly. Don't worry, I'll clean that up. I give Mango an extra cat treat, grab my book bag, and head out to the bus stop. Maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe it won't be that bad after all. Then why do I keep hearing freak, freak, freak over and over in my head? So that was chapter 5. I hope you enjoyed it. And... I guess we will, I will ask a question of the day. Um, so one question that I think would be cool would be, are you superstitious and why or why not? Because um, her, our, Mia's brother, little brother, Zach, is very superstitious and I can relate to the, some, some, of the, some of the things he believes, but not necessarily all of them. So yeah, do you have the same kind of beliefs as he does or like different or you just not at all so yeah that is the question of the day don't think anyone is really doing it but who knows maybe it'll catch on so i'm gonna do it anyway but yeah um i will see you in chapter six which i will hopefully be posting very very soon bye